This is the President McCormack Podcast with your host, Mark McCormack. Ladies and gentlemen of the podcast, today we have Gregory Brown. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Mark. Absolute <laughs> pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you for coming on. Um, we we're just kind of chatting a little bit. Your story um, is very, is very, very interesting from the very beginning. Um, tell us about it. Tell us how, how did this world start for you. So, world started for me in Sacramento, California. Um, I'd say I say it was a little rough. So, two my 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 parents. Um, they didn't have the strongest marriage. So there was, there was a lot of battles and, uh, I'd say my mom and my dad both struggled with mental health issues or maybe issues adapting into the world or stuff they had to work through that maybe they didn't work through. Um, so I was thrown into uh, a life of kind of immediate adversity. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I'd say, you know, Growing up from from newborn to eight years old was kind of a chunk of my life, and and the chunk ended with being taken, put in group homes, foster care, for the remainder of my childhood, young adult or, or, or uh, youth. So that's yeah. the that's the the nutshell version. So do you go with that with that story a little bit? Um, are you in contact with your parents still? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what do you remember being taken? I do. It was a very traumatic day, and I, I remember it crystal clear. How does that affect your life now? Uh, so for the longest time, it was it was a moment of intense sadness. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the further I dug into it, and I do a lot of digging and a lot of a lot of trial and error, and and a kind of a mental recalibration, and and uh, now I look at it as a as a moment where I was able to overcome something really hard because I'm still alive and I made it. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, I think I learned some, some lessons from that day. So it affects me positively, but, but in the, the negative light is just a an intense moment of sadness. Yeah. And uh, I never let it make me a victim, but I definitely let it affect me uh, mentally. Yeah. So was it when you were eight? I was eight years old. Yeah. I was, it was September 1998. Yeah. 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 Where did they, where did they place you? Did you place with the family, uh, family members, or was it someone you didn't know? It was someone I didn't know at all. And it was, it was, that was the other really hard part. So just to, just to tell the story a little bit, we were living in Carson city or no, sorry, Dayton, Nevada, which is close to Carson city. And my dad was living in California. So, we had to go to court for the custody battle in California because that's where it all started. So was it, was it your parents versus the state? It was, it was my mom versus my dad for custody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then it ended up being them versus the state at that. It was kind of a surprise to me. Yeah. But my mom puts me and my, my brother, who's just a few years older than me in a kind of the court daycare and says, I'll be right back. And then we'll go home or we'll get some lunch or, uh, so she never came back. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, excuse me. No, you're good, but yeah. Did she, um, did she know she wasn't coming back or was she told after that? So I, I believe she was told in the court hearing, um, at least when I talked to her. Yeah. But yeah, we were transported by the police in the back of a police car to some holding center for kids until they could place them with the family. Um, so yeah, they placed us with the family um, down in Vallejo, California, which was about, well, if I remember, it's about an hour to, into the Bay Area, an hour from Sacramento. And uh, the lady said that, that she'd be our our new mom for the time being. And it was just really confusing. Yeah. And I didn't take it very well. Yeah. (laughs) So did they, did an authority figure explain to you what was going on or did they give you any hope that you see your mom again or was it? Yeah. The, the hope was that they were doing an evaluation on us and they said it would take a couple days and that my mom would, would pick us up at that point or they'd, they'd bring us to our mom. 
Um, I saw her maybe two weeks to a month later. That to an eight year old, it felt like an eternity, and I never really got the exact time frame when I saw her again. But I yeah. But uh, it, it was definitely some. There was some. There was some space between when I saw my mom at the court to where she visited us in Vallejo, and uh, yeah. So the the hope was false. I mean, yeah. it, it definitely died quickly. Yeah. Were you with your brother? Yeah. So for the first few months, we were together. Oh, you got, you, and you got separated from him yeah. too. So we got separated because I, I was violent with my foster families, and when I say violent, I was an eight-year-old saying, "Hey, I want to see my mom," and they would say no. So then I would push past them and try to run out of the house, and they would drag me back in the house, and I would push them and try to run back out of the house, trying to get to my mom. Yeah. Um, were they kind? Not entirely. Yeah. The, the third home I was in, she was, she was, I don't know if she was married or engaged or had a boyfriend. I don't know what the situation was, but the guy would take me behind. He would take me for a drive and take me behind grocery store and threaten to, to beat me if I didn't, if I wasn't nicer. Wow. So, I mean, I imagine I was difficult. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was his method. Yeah. So that was his method. What did you think when he was saying that to you, though? Well, I, I was really scared. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I honestly thought that, that he was going to really hurt me. Yeah. He never did. It was all threats and yelling and kind of in my face, just a way to scare me straight, I guess. But that, that's never worked for me. I've always been kind of a stick to my guns type of guy. So yeah. just got me more riled up. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Um, how long were you in foster care for? So foster care lasted September, lasted about four months. Okay. Um, I could be wrong on the timeline. And then they, they moved me to group homes where they could actually restrain you and and uh, lock you in rooms. Yeah. So that was when I was nine. It was my first group home like that. Okay. And how long were you in group homes for? All the way until I was 17. Wow. Yeah. So explain to explain to me what what's it like being in a group home? Is it a lockdown facility? Yeah. Well, there's different in California. There's different levels. I don't remember it precisely, but let's just say there's there's the low level, which is about like a level eight, I think, and then there's the high level, which is level fourteen. Mm -hmm. So level eight, you're you're kind of in just a regular house in the community, and you go to a regular school, but you still have staff members that are on rotating shifts that watch you, and you're with other kids that that have uh, family trouble. And then level 14 is where some places have alarms on the floor at night. So the motion sensor alarms, or if you get out of bed, it beeps, or you have to, yeah, I need to use the bathroom, you know, in the middle of the night, and they'll turn the alarm off for a sec, which we had fun with that one. Yeah. But, uh, and then they could restrain you. There's, there's like three different escalation levels of the restraint. They just hold you by the arm, then two people hold you, then they, there's four, and they throw you against one, and they throw you on the ground. And that's, I believe, level 12 and 13 are allowed to do that and lock you in a room. Yeah. So, yeah, it just depends on kind of, I, I, of course, I'm, I'm, I've always been kind of an extreme guy, so I took it to the limit. Yeah. And, uh, so did you end up like in a level 14? Yeah. Yeah. When I was eight or nine, sorry, the first place was a level 14, very first. Oh, geez, right yeah. off the bat. Did you ever graduate down? Yeah. Uh, at the first place, they had an off-campus where it was just a regular house. He didn't go to a regular school, but they they put me in that place pretty quickly because I kind of mellowed out for a second. Yeah. It was just for a second, and then they yeah. brought me back to the... Yeah, for me, it wasn't a matter of I wanted to act up and be crazy. I just wanted, just wanted to be home, Yeah, which, you know, as we get deeper into the story, I, I've concluded that probably wasn't a good idea for me to be home. Yeah, to I just didn't home. know that. It's right. my attachment. So. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, I'm thinking about it, man. It's like, man, how do you at eight years old just get ripped out of everything you know, your safety, your shelter, your, you know, and get stuck in a, in a group home with a whole bunch of other kids, right, that are yeah. in the same situation you're in? Yeah, the first one, I think a few hundred kids were at was this it? place. It was more of a... I think it was an old hospital or old nunnery converted into a group home in Yakaya, in Yakaya, 
you got to California. Yeah. When did you end up giving up hope that you were going to be able to go home? I never did. Um, I, uh, I was in group homes. They considered me like a runaway risk because I was always running, trying to get back home. So in, in Yakaya, I slept in the Redwood Forest at nine for a few days. Really? You know, just because I, I wanted to be anywhere but that place. And uh, I was asking people to give me a ride to my mom. <laughs> and the first lady, well, I ran away multiple times. The first lady, she just took me straight to the police station, as she should have, because what do you do with the, yeah. a nine-year-old? But, uh, yeah, I don't think I ever gave up hope. I'm pretty persistent. Yeah. Was your mom ever allowed to come see you? Yeah. So supervised visits. Um, the, the only thing is she didn't come a lot. Yeah. Um, one of the, yeah, she, she moved back to Nevada. So she was far away. Yeah. Um, my dad also came for the supervised visits. They were separated at this time. So those were always positive, but really depressing. Yeah. How come they, how come they weren't allowed to get you back? So my mom and, you know, she tells the story differently, but my mom made allegations against my dad during the custody situation. My dad made allegations or truths about my mom. Um, some of it added up with, like, you know, some abuse or bruises or yeah. stories. They added up, so Child Protective Services got involved, and they never resolved those, those issues. Right. So we couldn't go back. So at 17, when you finally got out of it, where'd you go? So, 17, I lived with my brother, and then I got my own place and went to college to study kinesiology, because I had gotten my GED uh, right at the end of, say, right when I turned 17, I got my GED, yeah. and just enrolled directly into college in Roseville, California, or Rockland, California. Oh, yeah, Rockland. Yeah. yeah. Nice. What university was it? Or this, college? This was Sierra College. Sierra College? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the only problem was I didn't have any history of staying any place <laughs> for longer than, you know, I moved 53 times. In group ages, homes? Yeah, group homes and Jewish. from foster care to the group homes from the ages of 8 to, to 17. So. Is it all over Northern California? Uh, Northern California, yeah. So as far as San Francisco, Ukiah, and then yeah. Sacramento proper. So... Yeah, no history of remaining in one place. <laughs> so I never lasted long, even as a young adult. Did you feel free when you got out, though, at 17? Yeah, it felt amazing. Yeah. Especially because they essentially treated me as an adult, which felt which felt nice. Um, but the world was so foreign. Yeah. I guess they could say I was institutionalized <laughs> <laughs> from a very young age. So... I think that, I mean, when you tell people about this stuff, does it shock them? Yeah. Um, I don't think people expect it. Yeah. No, because you actually seem very put together and mild-mannered. You know, you feel, you know, all the interactions that we have, you know, they're they're highly intelligent. And, you know, I mean, you're obviously a success story coming out of the situation you're in. But I imagine it breaks a lot of people. A lot of kids just get broken and then they end up, you know, getting... I'm sure heavily into drugs and re rebellious activities just because they're like, screw this. You've, you've taken my freedom away. You've taken my parents away. I'm yeah. Gonna give it back to you basically. Right. Absolutely. It's like, there's, there's really nothing to lose. There's like a, it's like a mindset in some people and I, I'm guilty of having this. It's like, well, you know, just in this group home and I have nothing to lose. And, you know, we hear all these stories of people doing all this fun, you know, quote, fun stuff that we think is fun. So it's a kind of an easy trap to fall into, especially when you don't have strong role models or educated people. Cause you know, there's, there's various types of mindsets and, uh, sadly, most of those places, the mindset's very poor, yeah. but poor mindsets are just so false. The world is just such a open, optimistic, opportunistic place. I mean, yeah. I mean, you, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you know this. And most people you chat with, it's like with hard work and the right goals and metrics and, and uh, focus, you could make anything happen. Yeah. Anything you want. Yeah. But they don't teach you that. 
No, no. <laughs> I bet. I mean, when you left the group home, where did you think your life was going to go? Um, so I, I thought I was going to be a sports doctor. That's why I studied kinesiology. Nice. <laughs> and uh, I was going to go be the guy that ran out on the field and, and, uh, help the injured player or, you know, yeah. so that, that's, that's where I thought it was going to go. Nice. Um, and I thought I was going to be successful and drive a nice car and all the things that you think success is yeah. and have a cool house and the, the hot girlfriend or wife or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and it was going to be pretty instant. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Maybe after real quick. school thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so did you finish school? No, no. I, uh, I moved around colleges for a while from 17 to, to 19 and, uh, never really finished anything. And I went back later, a few years after. So when I was 23 or so, but I still haven't finished school. That's a, a fun story. I'm sure we'll dig into yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you another couple of questions about the group home, just cause it, I find it fascinating. <clears throat> you know, like I grew up in a home, you know, where like, you know, my parents told me they loved me a lot and they, um, you know, they were there, you know, I was coming home to home cooked meals and, you know, even though I was doing stupid kid stuff as well, probably at a totally different level, but would you, were you able to like replicate that with friends inside group homes or did you just go without for years and years without feeling like the safety and the love in a home? Yeah, there was, there was no safety, no love and, and really hard to make friends Yeah, because we moved a lot. Um, so I think I had some attachments and, you know, they were broken up pretty quickly. In the higher level group homes, guys that come from juvenile hall are, are court ordered there. So you get guys that are like planning and scheming crimes within the, in the group home. So yeah, the level of people you interact with is, it wasn't a friend circle. Yeah. So I, I have zero people that I met in those group homes that I talked to today. Yeah. Um, Really hard to come by friends. Did you find any kindness? Yeah. So I think, I don't know if it was Big Brother or some of those groups were able to come into the group homes and mentor the the guys that were most troubled yeah. or struggled the most. And I had a lot of mentors. And I actually still think about some of the that kindness or things they said. Even, you know, they had budget. They were able to take you and drive you out of the group home and go to the store and buy you stuff. And, you know, sometimes they give me those little like skateboard finger skateboards and oh, yeah. that was kind of my thing at a young age. It was fun. And, and they'd buy like little toy, toy cars, but those were always like little, little sparks of, of happiness for me. Yeah. But I was so tunnel vision on getting back to my mom that, that the sparks didn't last long. Did the environment just keep on clamping down on that one goal? I mean, is that how you were able to keep the fortitude of just like, I'm going home to my mom and just the environment just clamps you down to that? Yeah, I was, I was always tunnel vision to that one goal. So it didn't matter what happened or what day it was. Yeah. I always wanted to be somewhere else with someone else. In this case, my mom. Um, yeah, that's all I thought about. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. Did you, so when you, when you got out of 17 and started going to college then with your brother, did you see your mom a lot? So she moved to Utah. And uh, she kind of, I feel like she kind of gave up hope. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, the, the funny thing is we never had a relationship after yeah. I got out. And, uh, yeah, really interesting. It's almost like she tries to get a, as far away from me as possible. She lives in Florida now. Oh, does she? And, uh, like, I'm right here in Utah. Did you come to Utah because of her? Yeah, I did. Um so my, my mom and two brothers lived in Utah, so that's why I came out here. Yeah. And uh, we never developed a relationship. It was just too too much pain. Yeah. Is there a lot of guilt on her side? And did you... Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of guilt, and it's the way she handles the guilt. Um, we just... And, I, and when I say a lot of guilt, she guilts, she guilts me. Let's, let's back up for a second. So my mom... Yeah believes that she tried really hard to get me back and it just never worked and that she's the victim and that we should have been with her and, and, uh, 
that she should still be seen as the hero. But obviously that's not my story yeah. that I felt. Um, so it's just really hard to communicate the pain I felt with her because it immediately goes into right. to how she feels. When did you realize that? Uh, I realized that. So I started noticing on the visits when I was 12, 13, 14. Yeah. That it was mostly a guilt trip when we talked. And uh, it really just hit home when I was 18, 19. Yeah. How, so when you when you were 17, had she already moved to Utah? Yeah, yeah. How, she, how she, old were you when you came to Utah? I was almost 19, so I was 18. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever live with her? Briefly, for a few weeks. Yeah. yeah. Mostly it was like a visit. Right. So, so you kinda, yeah, yeah. kind of stayed there for a minute? Oh, wow. So how are you, uh, how do you interact with her now? Well, now we do phone calls and FaceTime sometimes. I'd say once or twice a month. Yeah. Um, she tries to reach out to me a lot, but yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, it's kind of, I just don't, I don't really take the time to talk to her now. It's, there's, there's still a lot of pain. Yeah. Are you doing something to deal with that? Yeah, so I, I have someone that I that I talk to about just how I'm feeling, and and uh, I got into the meditation and you know just trying to be the master of my mind and thoughts for quite the quite a long time, yeah. and uh, you know I, I wouldn't say I'm perfect, but I'm I definitely can I have a lot more self control than I used to. I could remain in a place and focus on goals, yeah. and uh, I'd say meditation and. Uh, talking about it or at least trying to get perspective. So, so therapy is one of my methods and I like a, a therapist as your brain consultant, you know, somebody that you bring into your, your, your life to, to give you a different paradigm. Yeah. So I yeah. found that really helpful. It, it reminded me that, that I, it's going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, that, uh, some of the things I experience are normal and just going to work through them. So, right. Right. Yeah, some things, right? Yeah. Some things. <laughs> I mean, your upbringing's extremely unique. Yeah. You know, um, and you're not married yet, right? So I was married. Oh, were you married? Yeah. Uh, not married anymore. Yeah. Just married to to work, no girlfriends. So. <laughs> Did you have any kids? Yeah. So I have a boy and a girl. Amazing. Okay. I get to I get to spend time with them a lot. Right. We're pretty good at getting better at yeah. co-parenting. So do you think that the relationship with your mom and dad right now, does that, what, how does that affect with your kids? Uh, I, I feel like I have a lot more empathy when it comes to, so there's, there's two sides of it. You know, my, my son is, is me. He's persistent. He's stubborn. And he asks why about everything and he doesn't listen yeah. and uh, he's difficult, but I'm excited because those are very successful traits. They could be developed into successful traits. So I, instead of getting upset with him or, or doing some of the things my parents did to handle, handle me being difficult, I just take a step back and I'm not perfect at it, but, uh, I try to help him develop yeah. and, and just think, what did I need as a kid or what do I need now? Or what do I, yeah. you know, what would have helped me? feel loved and supported with my unique kind of self. So, so that's how I take the approach to my son. Yeah. How old is he? He's almost seven. Okay, great. Yeah. And your daughter, how old is she? She's three months. So oh, she's way young. Yeah. yeah she's yeah. a little, little baby. <laughs> <laughs> so with her, it's easy. I just, I just cuddle with her and change yeah. her diapers. And, yeah. Kiss on her. And, and yeah. Kiss on her and give her, give her milk. So and she's nice. happy. Nice. So, so then you recently divorced. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, we divorced, we divorced about four and a half years ago. Um, and then I've always wanted a family. And, uh, so I, I, I asked her, maybe begged her, I don't know if we could try it again. And we did yeah. and, uh, it didn't work out. So we decided to, to go our separate ways. And, uh, I'd say for me, I, I think I just struggle being in, personal relationships i'm good at the business relationships but yeah. but uh so i'd say she's a lot better than me <laughs> yeah 
and uh I still still need to work on that area <laughs> big time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's, I mean, an outsider's perspective, obviously, where I can, can understand it, you know, yeah. you, gotta, you, you were the steward of your own emotions for a long, 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 long time, you know, and then when you're in relationships, <clears throat> you know, you're, I don't know if responsible is the right word, you know, but you take on other people's emotions and you got to deal with all of that. At the same time, you know, you're being very successful and, in the business world and it's uh it's hard you know i think it's hard for everybody yeah you know I, my parents generation is interesting or our parents generation is interesting because they they look at divorce with such like shame i guess is probably the best way to put it right right and i uh t i mean nowadays right if someone tells you the divorce you're like oh okay yeah what happened you know like it's just like this yeah. A lot more normalized conversation, right? And you're like, oh, you know, even what you're saying, right? It's like, yeah, it didn't work. I mean, parts of it was my fault, you know, and then we tried it again. It just didn't work. So we're, we're just trying to do what's best for everybody involved now. Right. And I, I think there's a lot of admiration in that, you know, instead of, I don't know, hating each other, staying together for the kids or, or whatever, right? You know, Absolutely. It's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. And then, you know, where you come, I, I, when you're dating someone, Right. Do they, how much weight do they put into the way that you grew up? I feel like I get, I get some, uh, they definitely, they, they take it into consideration and they're a little more forgiving. Yeah. Um, when I, when I'm not the best at showing empathy or for me, my biggest thing in relationships, and this is where the struggle is, is, is I've had so much adversity in my life that, pain doesn't affect me. I mean, we could have a really horrible day and it's like, well, I've had worse days. Right. So I don't, I don't feel <laughs> shitty, Yeah. but that's not the case for uh, ex wife or, you know, girlfriends. They, you know, or anybody, normal people, normal, whatever normal is, yeah. um, get frustrated about normal stuff. It's harder for me to get frustrated about that stuff. Yeah. And, and, uh, and not everybody's in the box. Not everybody's like that. But in my experience in relationships is, is there's frustration. I'm, and I just kind of, I, I tend to blow it off. I'm like, well, cool. Okay. What are we having for dinner? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is wrong and not okay, but it's hard for me. Well, is, is it wrong? To, is it wrong to have that attitude? You know, I, and I'm glad you're challenging that. I don't think it's wrong. I think it's, it's a, it's a way to evolve above the bullshit. Yeah. And that's why I consider myself lucky. Yeah. I had so much adversity that bullshit doesn't affect me. Some does. Um, but so, so I, I look at that as kind of a superpower. My, my, my upbringing gave me a superpower. Yeah. And in business and in growing businesses and the stress and it's, that's a needed skill. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So I think it's a skill that leaders would pay a lot of money to develop. You know, tunnel vision, staying on task, which you obviously developed that. And then, yeah, just like not getting swayed by every blow of the wind. Yeah. Right. So it's just like, that's just not that big a deal, man. You know, like we're normal people. I like, <laughs> right. how you, I like how you say that, you know, because what is normal, I totally agree. But it's like, why are you getting all upset about this? You know, like there are so many other things that could happen. Let's just stay on track. Right. But I kind of get that feeling. It's like, Part of being focused is just not giving in to like insignificant shit. Absolutely. Because there's so much stuff to dwell on. We could, we could dwell on, especially in a business, we could dwell on. Yeah. Yeah. You get it. Um, but we need to focus on the, the right things. Yeah. And sometimes the right things mean we have to ignore some pain and we're not ignoring it because we don't care about it. Maybe sometimes we don't care about it, but we're ignoring it because we're trying to rise above it and get to the, the bigger vision. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, one of my favorite things to do <laughs> or guide people through Yeah, <laughs> or say, it's going to be okay. Let's focus yeah. on this and that will go away. I promise. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Cause I, I have people ask me, you know, like my wife sometimes would be like, oh, I feel like you're really stressed. And I'm just like, I'm not stressed. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I've been stressed. Like, but then I kind of go to my world and I'm like, well, I can see why some people would get really stressed with a lot of these things, you know, because a lot of the stuff that I just do all day is just make decisions, right? 
Right. Someone brings me something that, 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 you know, and I've seen people where like, and some of those decisions are big, you know, do we keep this person? Yeah. You know, do we need to hire this person? You know, where are we going to allocate these funds? What are we going to do for this? Is this a, you know, when we look at the private equity stuff, right? This is a $15 million deal. Do we want to do this? And it's right. like, yeah, let's do this one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. All right, no, I don't like that one. You know, and it's like decision-making comes so quickly for me, but I think other people would be like, oh my gosh, we've got to take $15 million and put into this deal. And what if it doesn't work? And, you know, they start going down the path of all the what ifs. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, we know these seven things. Yeah. They all lead to success. You know, the probability on this thing without even diving into it's probably 65, 75%. So let's figure out if it's actually more like 90. Yeah. You know, like that's kind of the attitude I take towards things, right? And um, it, it's definitely a skill. It, and and that's why when you when you said, you're like, oh, you know, it, it's almost like I've, I, you've had that fight before, right? And you're just I like, have, yeah, yeah, I understand your feelings. But really, it's like, no, let's plow through this stuff. Yeah. Appreciate you challenging that. It's absolutely agree. Um, it's, but for some reason it's not good for relationships, <laughs> at least in my experience. So. Yeah. Well, not, gosh, relationships, man. What a, what a minefield. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure anybody could yeah. sit in this room, you, you know, any guy that's married or gal that's married and it's tough no matter what. Yeah. Um, and when I was in couples therapy, I think this guy said it perfect. The the partner for you is the one that you could handle conflict with well. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, so there's going to be conflict. Yeah. So how do you handle conflict together? And uh, so that's that's in the back of my mind. I'm going to save that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, that's, that's great advice. Yeah. I think that's the beauty of my, my marriage is you know, we've been married for 18 years. And we do handle conflict really, really well. You know, we don't we've never gotten into the weeds on almost anything that I can think of. I mean, we have petty, stupid fights sometimes, right? Where I think she's chewing too loud or, you know, yeah. whatever. I just, <laughs> hell, half the time it's just to spice it up a little bit, right? <laughs> it's like, we're too, too agreeable with each other, you know? Like, shut your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell are you doing? But we're also on the same page where it's like, these, these are the 10 things that we find important. We're not going to get distracted outside of these 10 things anymore, you know? This last year, I, I've really learned for myself that I've there's things I have to cut out of my life. And sometimes those are people. Sometimes those are things that occupy your time. Like It's like one of them could be social media. You know, like if you're a person that's just constantly on social media, it's like, yeah. dude, your productivity level is garbage. Absolutely. You know, it's just a total waste of time. Even down to like watching TV all the time or watching sports all the time. You know, because I, yeah. I want to... I have my goals and I'm just going to stay focused on them and I'm not going to let the world distract me. The world can be very distracting. There's so many things set up to distract you and take your money and take your time. Yeah. And uh, I always found that fascinating. Um, so personally, I try not to let things take my, my money or time unless I want them to, unless yeah. it could, could somehow help me or, or benefit me. Yeah. Or if it has to do with you know, building a relationship. So those are always important, but yeah, hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. So tell me, tell me about your, um, you kind of like your business world, you know, you, you, you uh, stopped doing college. What were kind of some of the jobs you had in your early twenties? So yeah, first jobs for me, um, were retail. I worked at Abercrombie and Fitch and Anchor Blue, Bed Bath and Beyond. Did you really? Yeah. Okay, so, so we gotta go straight to Abercrombie and Fitch. Okay. Have you seen the documentary on them? I haven't. Okay, it's on Netflix. You have to watch it. So uh, let me ask you a question. Did you work? Where did you work? What was your job? So my title was model, and I stood in front of the store, <laughs> love sometimes it. shirt off, sometimes shirt on. For real? Yeah. Oh, cool. And my job was to say literally, "Hey, what's going on?" Yeah. <laughs> and if I see a pretty girl that looked like she could look nice in the clothes, then I would ask for a number and we'd, we'd hire them Yeah. or we'd go to the lake or wherever and recruit. So were you at the headquarters? No. I, so I worked at the Roseville Galleria. Gosh, I'm going back to the documentary now. So like what you're saying is just cracking me up, right? Cause it's like it, the documentary is basically on how they only hire hot people, their <laughs> definition of hot people. Right. 
But who, like the owner or like the CEO or whoever, right? Was it a publicly traded company when you were with them or was it private? You know, I, I don't remember at that yeah. time. I, was, I wasn't focused on that, but. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got to watch the documentary. And I, blow I have your mind. to now. So the hot people thing's funny. So, so when I, so they said when you apply and you go to the interview, where Abercrombie and Fitch close. Yeah. But I was, I was 18 and I couldn't afford Abercrombie uh-huh. and Fitch. Because I didn't have parents or anybody to buy for me. Yeah. So I, lo- I got lookalike clothes at Walmart. So the only thing I did buy is I bought an Abercrombie and Fitch shirt. And then I got look like like the cargo shorts and I wore flip-flops. Yeah. And uh, they hired me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, good. Walmart had my back. And yeah. I was able to make out okay. But, <laughs> and then eventually they, they require you to wear the, the clothes in the store. So pretty much yeah. your paycheck pays for your clothes just to work there. Oh, really? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dude, it's such a funny world. So on the documentary, they had a bunch of, like, guys and girls that, like, stocked clothes at night or, like, were folders in the back. And they're like, yeah, I wasn't pretty enough to be out front. And then you're like, yeah, I was one of the models. <laughs> I'm like, yes. I was out front. I, the one more job the job role is I had to spray the cologne every, I think it was every 20 minutes. The spritzer really? bottle yeah. that was hidden in one of the fake plants. And yeah. it was the fierce, the Abercrombie fierce. Oh, I remember it. it. Yeah, so <laughs> not a bad kid. <laughs> so how long were you there for? Uh, I was there for about six months. Nice. Yeah. Dude, that's got to go. That's got to go in your like bio somewhere. Yeah, that's I, freaking funny. From there, I got recruited by like some underwear model like company, and it was like basically just photographers that like shot your stuff off to different companies and got oh, you really? gigs. I did that for a little bit. And then I never bailed and got tattoos and said, you know what, I'm moving on. <laughs> oh, you have tattoos? Yeah. Where at? Uh, just uh, chest and oh, okay. rib cage. Nice. Um, yeah. Tons of them? Yeah, four, yeah. Yeah, yeah. cool. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to do I'll have to check those out later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish they were cool. Oh, man, I can't. I don't know. I don't know why I'm geeking out on you just being an Abercrombie model. Mostly because I just saw that stupid thing and everyone. So everyone in that documentary is complaining they weren't hot, basically, right? Really? <laughs> oh yeah, because it's like the evil side, you know. It's only hot people, all this kind of stuff. I yeah. I was Abercrombie. So when I was in high school, you know, I'm a, I'm a, about eight years older than you, right? And so Abercrombie, it, it was like on the way up, right? Yeah. Probably like ninety six, ninety seven, right? Something like that. And so, and I had Abercrombie uh, clothes, and we had the, we had the cologne. I was an Aqua Geo guy. Oh uh, yeah, that was my, I, st- my I still love Aqua weapon of choice. Yeah, it's a good one. And uh, but I mean, Abercrombie was huge. I mean, girls had to wear it. Everyone had to have something. You know, the double polos were huge in like my senior year. They would wear two polos and pop yeah. the collars. You know, all that kind of stuff. I remember that <laughs> really preppy and. Oh, girls cool. would try and steal the big, the big posters. I guess you'd call them. They're more like, you know, the canvases that were. I were pulled of like the guys. So when they changed their campaigns, they take those off and put them in the garbage in the back and people sort of just going through all their garbage. So they ended up having to like, um, dispose of them somehow, shred them or burn them or cut them or gotcha. something like that. But I had friends that had full on, you know, eight by four posters in their bedrooms. that was from Abercrombie and Fitch. <laughs> That's amazing. So and then we had the girl, oh, the song that came out, the LFO song, the, I like girls that wear Abercrombie and Fitch. <laughs> I mean, I could, you couldn't escape Abercrombie and Fitch yeah, in the late to, '90s. Way to take off as a brand, and yeah, that's yeah. Oh no, they, yeah, they hit it out of the freaking park. I'll yeah. tell you that. So after you started after retail, what'd you move into? So after retail, um, let's see. I I don't often go back. Let's see. Thinking about the timeline, uh, so I think I got into <laughs> weed. So, and this is, this is really interesting is I, I always knew that I, that I had skills and I want to do my own thing and the circle I was around, um, you know, that's how you make it big in, in my part of Sacramento yeah. is you, is you're the, is you're the big drug dealer. Yeah. And uh, I was a horrible drug dealer cause I didn't last longer than a few days. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I'm one of the worst. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was my next thing. I said, "This is how I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna come up," yeah. and uh, didn't work out, thankfully. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was that was my next thing. Uh, didn't really have a have a real job, I'd say, after that at all. Actually, yeah, at all. That's when I discovered my true entrepreneurial talents. Yeah, in my early twenties. 
So what was the first entrepreneurial thing that you did? So it's really funny. I, uh, so I, my parents, my parents were LDS. I didn't grow up LDS, but I reconverted, you can say, in my yeah. early, early days. And uh, I thought I wanted, so I always wanted to be a writer. And, uh, and this one's really, this one's really funny. But I, I wrote a poem. I think it was a good poem. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of a spiritual poem. And at this point, I was living in Utah. And I went door to door trying to sell my frame poem. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, I was, my goal was to be a uh, motivational speaker, author, poet. And I thought if I go to door to door, I could raise some cash and I could use the cash to, I don't know, maybe write a book or actually speak and people will see this poem. And it was, it, doing that taught me a lot about rejection and yeah. getting laughed at <laughs> <laughs> and guys saying, you're at the wrong fucking house, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, dang. <laughs> so, uh, did you sell any? Yeah, I did. I sold like 20. Nice. Which was, which was pretty nice. It cost me, so frame and poem and printing, it cost me about $6 and I sold them for 25. So not bad. Nice. Good margin. Yeah. <laughs> was it just one day or did you do it over a couple of days? I did it over, over, uh, a few weekends. Yeah. Did you? I quickly yeah. realized there's better paths to, <laughs> to make money. But, yeah. Um, you always hear about the door to door guys. I'm like door to door. That's a way to get to the consumer. Yeah. I'll do it. I'll yeah. knock on a door. <laughs> Probably would have been better off selling uh, alarm systems or. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. But I was a little stubborn. So, so from there, I actually, I did have a, I did have a couple jobs where I was more of an entrepreneur, um, where, I worked for a, a company that helped businesses get funded, which turned out to be a crappy company. And I left and, mm. and exposed the, the crap. But my, my, uh, my position in the company was really positive. I helped people write business plans so they can get funding mm. and, or I wrote them for them or helped develop those plans. And, uh, and I created the whole department because companies need you know, for some lenders, they need a business plan. It doesn't have to be extreme or difficult, but just some sort of vision or focus on where your company is going and yeah. your skills. So I did that for a while. And then from there, I that's when I, I truly branched off into kind of some real cool stuff, some real like solving problems and helping entrepreneurs, uh, you know, handle the pain of business. That's really, I'd say that's really my thing is I, I like taking business owners' pain away and helping them yeah. actually develop and grow that's that's what it led into but for a brief moment so i, I went i went to lds business college yeah. and uh, i had a i had a professor and the first assignment in entrepreneur and entrepreneurship class was was to uh find something on ksl or something for free and resell it for a profit and the lesson was to talk about uh uh, you know, cost of goods sold and the risk to reward and, and how that relationship works. Well, I, I turned that into, I got a warehouse and I went to KSL and I, I filled the warehouse up with free stuff. And I actually made really good money selling junk from KSL, but it wasn't junk. Um, I would find businesses that were shutting down yeah. and getting rid of all their stuff. And for a business to sell all that stuff is difficult. So they like to give it away. So I would take U-Hauls and just take desks and tables and chairs um, one time I got the entire Shiloh. And so when Shiloh Inn converted to Holiday and they gave away all their mattresses, that was me. I got them all. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and sold wow. those for not a lot. Yeah. But, but I, I found this this guy that refurbished mattresses and he bought all of them or almost all of them from me. So. Oh, wow. So you're just picking them up and dropping them off? Yeah, then? well, I put them in my carport and yeah. I got fined by the HOA like six times before I got rid of them. <laughs> 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 but uh, it was a lot of mattresses. Um and then the, the biggest the biggest niche was Whirlpool brand washers and dryers, oh. parts interchange. You could put some appliance paint and uh, sell them as sets and deliver them and set them up. Yeah. So that was all free, KSL. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. For, <laughs> I'm sure you can still do it. So did you just re-put the stuff back on KSL to find your customers? Yeah, directly yeah. back on KSL. So washers and dryers go in the appliance section, make mm -hmm. sure they work, test them. Um, all the office furniture, just the furniture section. Yeah. So, and uh, sometimes I could find I could fix things up, but the real money was 
was the bigger items. I can go grab like a nightstand and, and repaint it. And there's not a lot of, not a lot of money in that yeah. to go pick up a nightstand. So every, yeah, every time I go pick something up, I ask myself, can I at least make $500 from this trip? Yeah. And it was worth it. So, yeah. So how much, uh, how much money would you make doing that? Like, uh, that was, a. Uh, you know, some sometimes I'd make a few thousand dollars in a day. Sometimes, a yeah. hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, I didn't really do bookkeeping, but <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was enough to to travel around and have fun and, yeah, and pay my rent. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, I was doing that. I this was when Airbnb was just starting, so I I rented my rooms and sometimes my house on Airbnb, and I would sleep in my car or the basement. Just anything I could do to really <laughs> to kind of take off and get some cash. Yeah. But, you know, to me, sleeping anywhere didn't matter because <laughs> of the places I slept growing up. Yeah. So really any, yeah, it's kind of whatever so, it took. So when you rented your house out, were you just, um, you just have it up, right? So if someone books it for three nights and you're just in the car for three nights and it's not booked you in your house? Car, basement, friend's house. Um, yeah. I'd come and make them breakfast. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so I'd meet them because I, I had people staying at my house from all over the world. I mean, they're because I live by the downtown convention center. Oh, it's kind okay. of a hit. So, you know, guys were going to conventions, Australians, Japan, China, uh, Germans, just kind of all over. So I wanted to meet people and yeah. chat about life and and uh, hear their stories. So I'd make them a little breakfast and talk to them. <laughs> what would you make for breakfast? Uh, simple, you know, eggs, sometimes just cereals. Just Sometimes yeah. I'd bring donuts or bagels. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm not a chef. Yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, but um, I think eggs was the common an omelet or, yeah. you know, something with toast. So what kind of, so what kind of things did you learn from people? I learned that the world's bigger than the, the I'd say that's the biggest thing I learned is the world's bigger and there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of opportunity to expand your mind and to, to, you know, take in, take in other, I'd say, other opportunities or other kind of approaches, other paradigms. Yeah. Um, Cause I grew up so sheltered, sheltered in the sense that I didn't see a lot of the world. I mean, you could show me a picture of Paris and I would think it's fake. Like Paris doesn't exist. Like, how is that even possible? Yeah. Um, but it does exist. So, the, so there's different ways of thinking and, and you can question your thinking and try something differently. Uh, and I'd say that was the biggest thing I learned is they opened my mind. Yeah. Um, what's the quirkiest thing you learned from somebody? Um, that Americans can't build houses. <laughs> 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 so these Germans went to my basement. Yeah. And uh, it, it's funny. They said, we don't build houses like this in Germany. You guys use wood down here. Yeah. And I just, I found that, I found that fascinating, you know. What do they use, like metal? Yeah, metal or, you know, stone maybe or. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so. I'd say that was, uh, that's probably not quirky, but it, it still makes me laugh. Oh, yeah. He, he wanted a tour of the place, and then he, and that was the first thing he said. And, uh, <laughs> um, you kind of shake your head, right? Just like, yeah, it's like, whatever. Okay, cool. Yeah. 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 So they built this one. Yeah. That's how they built this one and all the others. And we'll, we'll yeah, we'll, we'll be okay. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> so currently, so your current entrepreneurial. Well, your current business that you own, I should just call it that, right? Uh, it's building small homes. Yeah, small homes, um, prefab, just yeah. prefab in general. Um, yeah, right now, majority of what we build is, is ADUs, tiny homes, go in people's backyards. Yeah. And we, we build them in uh, wholesale quantities. So, you know, the builder, the marketer will come to us and we'll, we'll build four or so at a time. Yeah. And so the name of the company? Modules. Everybody, Modules. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you been doing it for? So I've been with modules for about seven months. Um, they, they started about a year and a half ago. So I came in right about the middle of middle of the start and, uh, got a, got to just knee deep in tidying everything up and getting ready for, for growth because the markets, I mean, a a lot of people are saying it. I believe it. Tiny homes or, or just prefab in general is the way of the future. Building yeah. in a factory and then putting it on site, getting 
uh, developments or investors return return quicker because we can open up and start collecting rents or you know sell quicker. So yeah, you know, people are opening their minds to it. How long does it take to build a tiny home? So it depends on how custom, but well, for the most custom, about seven weeks, and uh, the simplest about three. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have investors now that are buying them and like sticking them in a group and renting them? So we have a lot of projects like that being permitted or in the talks in the works. So yes, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's going to be our next year is, uh, building, building for groups. Yeah. Cause they've got that one. Is it boxable? Is that the one that's out of Vegas? Yeah, boxable. We talked about that a little bit. Yeah. Boxable is the one that had the, I think the DR Horton and the Elon Musk investment. Yeah. And they're building out a smart factory to to basically put together these little uh, these little boxes. Yeah. It's pretty exciting. So how do you see, do you view them as a competitor? Not entirely. Boxable, Boxable builds completely different than how we build. I mean, we're, we're more custom, but even if we weren't, um, we're looking to work with investors and developers and build communities. Mm -hmm. And that's one of our biggest focuses. Um, Boxable is looking at the, at the same thing, but in every community there's, there's diversity, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even in big, large homes, you have different elevations and I guess we could just be a different elevation. So we work together. It's, it could be synergistic if anything. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Um, what made you attracted to this world? Yeah, I uh, I love systems, problem solving, efficiencies. These are these are some of my favorite things. <laughs> it was really nerdy. I can nerd out on it, yeah. but so so just to you know my core my core business. What I thought my core business was for a while was I I come in and I help companies grow and sell. I was a business broker and then I thought you know business manager and then sell them because. I don't like selling crappy businesses and, yeah. and uh, sometimes they just need a little tweaking. So, so that was, that was my passion for a while. And then modules kind of, I feel like it kind of chose me. I mean, you look at all the, the history and all the things I've, I've gone through and developed and modules is an opportunity for me to put that all into one company and just explode it and uh, change the way we view building homes or commercial applications. Yeah. So I feel like we chose each other, and uh, I'm just going to roll with it. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, I think I asked you this when we went to lunch, but have they done any – do you guys do cabin stuff yet? Uh, we, don't do, we don't do cabin stuff. Um, we, we could, but, yeah, I guess, I guess the idea is, is we're, we're in a smaller warehouse right now, so we're focused on – core clients and, and similar builds, but we're actually moving in a few months to a hundred thousand square feet, which is a big jump. And uh, we could develop new lines. Uh, when I say lines, it's, it's a group of guys that are focused on similar builds. That way they could be efficient and keep the yeah. speed aspect. So that's in our, in our growth plan. So if someone buys uh, a small home right now, you, uh, what groundwork has to be done before they get to it, right? Because you got like the pad, septic, water, power, all that kind yeah. of stuff. So you identify the land, and then you, you you put together a concept plan. And that concept plan goes to the city, and they say, no, that's never going to happen. Or, yeah, we like it, give us more. And then you start developing engineered plans, and you, you start developing what your community look like looks like, what your building looks like. So that's a, that's a hefty process. From there, once it's approved and you have your permits, that's when you start doing your pad, your concrete pad, your foundation, your septic, your, 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 your all your utilities, um, and prepping for the building. So usually around the right before permits happen or around the time of permits, we start building, and then it gets shipped to you and craned right on the pad, set up in a day, and you, you could put a bed in there and sleep there that night. Yeah, you're off, to, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're off to the races. Yeah. So was, no more, yeah, waiting nine months for the stick build. Yeah. <laughs> After. So what's what's price per square foot coming out at? That's a that's a, a huge question because some people want the the twelve thousand dollars sliding glass doors and the yeah and the and the, the huge custom windows and the nice finishes and 
not a lot of guys want basic. You know, I, I'd say basic is going to be more the when we start doing the build to build the rent communities. Those yeah. be more basic. So that's still being developed, but that that's such a wide scale. But typically, um, and 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 we we do wholesale, so we're not direct to consumer. Um, typically, I think with the permitting process and everything, uh, a company like like uh, like builders like Modal Stack guys like those, uh, they're probably selling to the selling to the consumer for about three hundred thousand dollars for six hundred square feet. Um, you know, our wholesale price is enough to help them meet their margins. Yeah, but. So that's super custom stuff. That's why I, I, I like to focus on the developments and the efficiencies in the large quantities because then we can get our prices down and it'll start penciling for, for investors. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's going to be a big segment, right? Like doing yeah. a full neighborhood kind of thing. Do a full neighborhood. We order everything from China. You know, <laughs> we keep our margins low. We're yeah. there to make investors happy and still keep the quality. Um, so. What kind of warranties come with these homes? So for us, we do a, a one-year warranty. Everything that was not caused by transportation or, you know, the, the owner will, will send a team out there or have a local team fix um, fix whatever is wrong. Let's say, for instance, we, uh, we have a building and we forget to put a, a cap on the electrical. Uh, on, so, so we prep for solar, we prep for electrical to get connected. And uh, let's say we forget to put a cap on one of those and so does the electrician then uh, it's definitely our fault you know, from the water damage that gets in the hole. So we'll go out there and we'll replace floor, replace whatever whatever needs to be repaired. Yeah. And that's a, that's a funny, that's actually a growing pain. That was a true story. It happened once. Oh, <laughs> Somewhere yeah. a cap forgot to get put on. And I like those stories because, uh, you know, it stinks and the customer is not happy. But it's moments like that you're able to to strengthen your strengthen your company. Yeah. You know, from the adversity or the, the pain or the forgetfulness, yeah. <laughs> whatever it is. No, that's that's great. How many employees do you guys have out there? So a uh, mix of contractors, employees, we're sitting at about 30. Nice. Yeah. So you must have multiple trades working on the house at once then. Yeah. So we have different. So the building moves from, from start to finish. You know, there's the framing section, then it moves all the way down the line to the, the finish section. So uh, every... Every spot that it's in has a has a strategy to it, um, you know, for the rough guys, electrician, rough electricity, rough yeah. plumbing, all the way down to the finish work. Do you have to have it inspected before you do sheetrock, or is it? Yeah, so like so is the four way inspection the same? Everything's the same. It's actually a little more intense. So our factory is Intertech certified. Um, Intertech is, you know, one of the. They're, they're in everything. They're the, they're the biggest company you've never heard of. I mean, yeah. they're stamping computers, and they're just all about quality in, in, in tiny homes as well. So so Intertech approves everything, and they approve our factory and our policies for quality. And then we have, you know, a local inspector do a pre-framing inspection, the four-way inspection, and then all the way down, all the way to the finish. So everything has to, to match the plans yeah. and, and look structurally safe and sound and make sense. Yeah. So I know in general construction, right? Like it's hard to get your trades to go in the timeline you need them to go into, right? Do you guys face that or is your process down to where you kind of know A, B, C, D, E, F, G? I'd say our process is is getting close. We still have we still have a, a lot of work to do, but um, we're quick and our quality is is top notch. I mean, we find ourselves if the quality's not there, ripping it up and doing it over like yeah. that's the stance i have on quality um so so trades trades get along for the most part typically what i'm finding is our timelines are usually off by a week and a half that's why i i, I say it takes five five and a half weeks and ends up taking six to seven and a half weeks but it can take five and a half weeks yeah so that's what we're working towards and that's got to be one of the most important metrics, right? Because the faster you guys can build a house, the more money you're going to make on that thing. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We got to get it out of the line and get a new one in there. So, yeah. yeah. So, how many homes can you be working on at once? So, in our factory, we could fit currently seven at once. Okay. So. And the new one, what capacity does that go to? The new one, the capacity would be eighty-five. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. significantly bigger. Yeah, and we have the we have the pipeline and demand, and so. 
build it and they will come. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of little bit of that but so the people that are buying them i guess you're wholesaling so they're not so they're not actually financing them right so the people that are that are buying them are usually taking out um helocs or they have cash uh, and these are the these are the consumers and then they talk to companies like modal or like stack oh yeah and then they they pay them to kind of develop the whole project for them um so financing through heloc adu financing still isn't it's it's so new but i'm excited <laughs> when it actually exists that's when yeah that's when things are going to blow up because i think most of these companies have thousands of leads just waiting they don't have the cash to right to, to buy one so they're waiting for the financing piece so are these, are these structures that a normal person can just stick on their property now so you've got three quarters of an acre you know as long as you get a building permit right you yeah. can just pour a pad and stick it on pour a pad stick it on and do an airbnb yeah well, uh, building permits are the building permits and city code and all that fun stuff. That's the barrier. Yeah. That's the hard part. Um, but you know, you got smart guys figuring out the development process. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Now when I, when we've talked about this concept and even when I saw boxable, I looked at that and just thought, man, dude, you can get half an acre and throw I don't know, five on there comfortably maybe. Yeah. More. Then it's like, yeah, if you're renting these things out for 150 bucks a night, you know, and you get them in locations where they work well, you know, that's right. up to whatever those conditions are. They can be, it can actually be really, really profitable. Really profitable. What I find interesting is you could, let's just talk about Bear Lake. You could have a, a tiny home at Bear Lake and you could have a big cabin. And uh, the disparity between how much you're going to get per night <laughs> And you look at the square footage, it's more profitable to have the tiny home rented out than the big house. Yeah. And uh, that's what fascinates me. So for investors that want the short-term rental model, it's a, a great opportunity. I mean, you could even stack these things four high. So, oh, could you? Yeah. <laughs> so. How would you get into them up, up top? So, I mean, build some sort of external staircase with an exit. There. Okay. If there's ways to develop it. You could do another unit that's an inside staircase. I mean, you could just use the boxes however you want. Yeah. You know, four boxes could be staircase, lobby space, kitchen, co-community, and fun. And uh, the other four can be the living. If you stack them four high, do you have sound problems with people walking around? or? So these things are pretty well insulated. We haven't we haven't stacked them four high yet. Yeah. <laughs> so let's figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're spray foam insulated well, and they're built to withstand an earthquake. Because if you think about it, when they're shipped on the back of a truck, they go through an earthquake all the way to the location. Oh, exactly. So yeah. these things are these things are built tough. That was going to be one of the, my questions. Are, are, I mean, are they shaking trim loose, or is cabinets getting loose on the way to the location? Or are they staying pretty solid? They're staying solid. Sometimes you'll see shipping cracks on the corner of doors, and that's in the drywall. Mm -hmm. And then you just put some mud and some paint. It's not structural. Right. Structural solid, and we haven't seen cabinet issues. Just the the shipping cracks. Yeah, it's always in the the common. It doesn't happen to every unit. Yeah, um, but I think there's a way to eliminate those. It was just the name of the game. So I think they were worse at the beginning. The way they're better now is the way they're wrapped and put on the the truck, and I think they'll just sh ship flatbed. Yeah, like low boy. Yeah. Yeah, because the the height and the height restrictions. Um, so the cracks, we haven't seen a lot of cracks lately, but it's a, it's a small risk. Yeah. Um, and it's not, it's not detrimental. We're talking about a, a free patch job. Oh, <laughs> it right. It looks right. pretty again, but, but yeah, it's definitely almost eliminated, um, with the, the way we strap it and the tightness of the, the wrap and everything. Yeah. No, that, going for high, that's interesting. Yeah. Real interesting. It, is there building codes that prevent that? Or? Probably. Yeah. Uh, that's just, the, that's part of the battle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you think about it, hotels and apartment complexes are mostly boxes. Oh, so yeah. That's what that's what's always fascinated me. How does it pencil um, is the question. So is it more expensive than stick build or less expensive as we start stacking? But I think the real thing that excites me is, is, uh, we could build all the boxes and right when the pad's done, we could set it on there and everybody gets paid, you know, nine months, even nine, maybe nine months faster yeah. than investors yeah, because it's already renting and operational. Um, 
So that's that's the part that fascinates me. The applications on this are just endless, and I'm yeah. excited to figure it all out. What do you do for HVAC on the inside of these? So these are mini splits. Okay. Yeah, they're they're depending on the demand using you know three ton units or they're yeah. more than enough to to heat and cool. Are they normally one bedroom, two bedroom? So there's uh, we build studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms. Um, the biggest one being close to 600 square feet. The smallest one in the the 400s. Really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. My favorite look is uh, is a big unit with one bedroom and a huge like gathering space. Yeah. Opens up to a kitchen. Gotcha. Yeah. So how much bigger than a trailer is it? So, like, you're talking shipping container or just like the trailer? No, I mean of? like a like a like a trailer camper. So. Or like a motorhome. Yeah, motorhome there's. Or motorhome. So our width, the width we can go to. It depends on the state. So California is like 13.3, which is a little bit wider than a trailer. And then uh, and then here in Utah, we can go 16, 16 feet wide. So pretty roomy. That makes a big difference. Yeah, big difference. Yeah. Okay, cool. I guess if you had a big gathering area, you could also just have like a pull-out couch or something, right? Yeah, so a pull-out couch, maybe a Murphy bed with some – that acts as a storage. Uh, yeah. 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 A lot of ways to make it work. Nice. So how custom can people make these? So it's kind of like kind of like Mercedes, right? I mean, you have your your base model and it's affordable to, to most. Or you could you could take this thing all the way to the <laughs> the most decked out. So as long as it's within the box. Yeah. So or or kind of like the, the Ford Raptor. You take an F one fifty, you trick it out and now it's a now it's a Raptor. Right. Right. So so you have your box and it, there's structural limitations on windows unless you wanted to pay for like the metal framing upgrade or the, you know, so, I mean, you could, you could do a glass house if you really wanted to. It's going to be really expensive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah, I guess you can go pretty custom. Um, we find it's more rational to go mostly, mostly custom on the glass and, and, uh, do some really cool tile inside, some really nice appliances and and uh, bathroom fixtures, faucets, sink stuff like that. Yeah. And make it nice, but not make it crazy, right? Yeah, I mean, you could do like a two, three, four tone paint job. Yeah. Most people do the two tone. Yeah, but it's just from a factory standpoint, the more custom they go, the harder it is for us to actually make the money we need to make, or we just charge outrageous number for it. Right. So, I'm assuming they're all metal roof. Uh, TPO. What's that? Yeah, it's like uh it's uh it's it's the rollout kind of the rubber. Oh, okay. Like in a commercial building? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Why'd you guys pick that? That's so it's usually not us picking it. It's the the builder and the client. They talk the client into it. So I mean we do metal roofs as well. Yeah. But the most common is the TPO. Okay. Yeah. So we'll we'll build in wholesale based on what their architect is. We don't actually put together architectural plans for the client on our in-house stuff it's also tpo as well because we have in-house plans that we'll build for for our right. clients that kind of standard because we do commercial stuff we do soda shacks coffee shops um juice shacks and those are our in-house plans do you guys ever build like a like an igloo looking thing like a glass one no i've seen them they're cool yeah you know I see cool them a lot on instagram those actually those can get purchased in kits yeah. And then a contractor or somebody will build them. So those are almost better built on site. Oh, okay. The kit's just delivered to your backyard, and right. a contractor will come and, and build it after. If you want a foundation, the foundation's poured before the kit gets delivered. Yeah. So. Oh, wild. So in your industry, where do you go for, like, industry knowledge? Do you guys have conferences, or do you, or are you guys just so early in it, you're just designing and building? Yeah, so we, I mean, for, for us, it was... It was just design, build, go. We got some some cool clients and been having a lot of fun. As far as conferences, I think there's a conference coming up in Vegas. That's the Home Builders Convention. Yeah. And there's going to be a lot of talks of uh, of small homes. So I'm going. Nice, <laughs> we'll yeah. see what happens. We'll stir up some, we'll, we'll stir up some trouble and uh, yeah. meet some cool people. Yeah. But I think uh, I think the home builders, and this is what I've been hearing and seeing, especially with Dr. Horton's move, is is uh, they're interested in the diversity. Of, and especially the, the quick return on investment. 
of prefab. Yeah. So. Well, you look at it too. It's like <clears throat> homes are getting really, really expensive in the United States. And you have a lot of people that aren't married. Yeah. You know, they're single. And it, the trend in the United States seems to be that, like, there's going to be more and more single people, you know. So if you got a one-bedroom tiny house that you're living in, it, it just lowers your cost of living a lot. Absolutely. You can still be in a nice place in a nice area. I think it's gonna, I think it's what it's going to boil down to is where are these places, you know. The development needs to be in cool places. See, so yeah, not... Yeah, absolutely. Cool places and cool things to do in the community. So yeah. social community. So so you're not necessarily living in a tiny home. You're living in a community with a tiny home. Right. And maybe you have like a place where you can gather, or like a business resource center where you can go code or do your millennial job. Yeah. Uh, uh, or you could, you know, meet and greet. So, so I think what we've been looking at is how cool can we make these communities? Yeah. And how, how can we make it less about living in a tiny home and more about walking around and, right. and uh, you know, just uh, just a fun place to be. So, I mean, could we put one of these in the middle of nowhere as long as it's cool enough and has, like, some recreation? Like, maybe we have dirt bike trails and, and uh, yeah. razors and cool stuff you could do in hiking, but your community is kind of your hub. And we could change how people uh, go to work. Right now, people are working from home. What if we built the community around working from home? Yeah. And it was a small community, and tech companies can bring their employees there. And instead of having office space, now they have this tiny community. So not only do they have home ownership, but they have a place to work without paying for an expensive office. Yeah. So some of the things I've been thinking about. Yeah, no, absolutely. In a sense of community and stores close. And, you know, there's probably, there's probably certain cities where the urban development, like, I don't know, I'll just say Detroit. I might be wrong, but. You know, there's some old buildings. You knock those things down and yeah. build a really cool community in there. You could almost get government money to absolutely revitalize. We were doing that here in Utah. We're the other side village. Um, the other side village is a homeless community. The, the land was donated by the state. It's 200 units, and uh, they're about 400 or so square feet. Yeah, and they're they're expected that one to be open um, summer. I mean, we'll see. We're we're building a handful of them. Yeah. Uh, possibly all of them. I'm not sure yet, but um, ex excited to to see how that one looks. I think that's going to be a, a testament of an urban, small community yeah. that has restaurant and you know little Airbnbs, and there's going to be a homeless kind of rehabilitation aspect. Well, that's the core of the community is rehabilitating homeless. So where's that at exactly? That one is in Glendale, close to Indiana Avenue. Okay. Yeah. Well, good for us. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be, that, that'll be awesome if that model works. Absolutely. So I, I think that's one of the most excited things, exciting things for me about working with, with modules and, and developing modules is that we get a, that we get to be part of this, this community that's here in our own, you know, our own town. Right. Yeah. And uh, seeing what good it could do. And if it can do good, then there's a lot of other cities that need something like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I, I see housing as a major crisis. Yeah. You know, a lot for a lot of people too. You know, if you believe in, you know, depopulation, not if you believe it or not, but like there's areas that get depopulated and, you know, there's just these massive houses that are just sitting there collecting dust, doing nothing. And it's, you can convert a lot of these properties into sustainable model, more sustainable models with, with small homes. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty easily. It's amazing. Mm, excuse me. So going to you personally, what's what's your goals for the next five to ten? Goals the next five to ten. Uh, so right now I'm heavy on uh, building relationships with investors, landowners, uh, developers. Um, so meeting as many cool, like-minded people as I can to help change the paradigm of, uh, you know, building so, so I'd say, well, that's a, a business goal, and that's kind of consumes my personal life, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is okay because I enjoy it. Uh, personally, I think uh, balance comes to mind. Um, I think we all can relate. As an entrepreneur, we, we lose the sense of balance. Well, not everybody does. Some people are amazing, and I admire them. Um, but for me, I'd like to get back to balance. I mean, I'm probably 40 pounds 
too heavy <laughs> and I probably don't eat as healthy as I should most times and get the right sleep or exercise. Yeah. And I think the real testament of success, and I and I tell myself this, I ask myself, are you successful? And I say, not not yet, because I haven't I haven't reached the 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 caliber that I want to be. So I and I like I like telling myself that I'm not there yet. Because when you're not somewhere you you go there. But as soon as you're there you stay. So I'll probably never be there. The, the lack of contentness just to continuously better myself. Yeah. Um, so I balance comes to mind, and I, I'd say that's, you know, building those habits is probably a, a good year project, and I, I've been working on it, slowly improving, um, which is which is powerful. Um, you know, another personal goal for me is, you know, being a father. I didn't have that, and I don't want anything to distract me from that. I want them to always be my priority, so I constantly remind myself about that, and I'd I'd like to. You know, in the next five to ten years, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a teenager, two teenagers, yeah. uh, or close to it, and uh, that's a big deal. So, helping them prepare for that yeah. is is uh, is a big goal. You know, I don't I don't think anywhere in my goals is like nice cars, big houses, big money. I think that will come and it'll be fun. And if it doesn't come, it'll still be fun. Um, but I. I love the world, um, traveling, you know, changing my perspective, meeting people. That's fun to me, being a good dad yeah. and, and getting balance. I think that's going to bring the real happiness. And with that, once I figure it out, I'd love to go back to my, my childhood dream, which really was a childhood dream for me, and and, and uh, write some, some cool books, whether fiction or nonfiction, and actually get on a stage and, and speak to people and, and talk to people about uh, – about my story and, and uh, maybe inspire people, maybe be inspired by people in the audience. I don't know yeah. how that would look, but developing that pathway over the next, the next five to 10. Um, I imagine business wise in 10 years, we've already changed the, the paradigm of, uh, of uh, building homes and homes and communities. And we have some, some pretty amazing, uh, you call them tiny home communities or prefab communities out there. Maybe we've even changed the mind of commercial builders and we're doing bigger units and stitching them together. Yeah. Um, I imagine that's that's already happened. And and uh, just continuing to hone in and develop that future, that's going to be really fun. So, yeah, that's... That sounds exciting. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what else in life makes you happy? Yeah. Uh, I love to read. I love to hike, go out, go outside. I like time to just breathe. Um, so I just recently moved and I have to put my library back up, but I have a pretty large book collection. Yeah. And, uh, I love just sitting down, getting into a book, um, meditating, you know, maybe putting the book on my lap and just closing my eyes and thinking, you know, over the last, over my lifetime, I've, I've been in positions where I, all I had was my, my mind and I had to think yeah. a lot. So I still, I find that one of my greatest escapes and it makes me happy. Um, spending time, spending time with uh, my kids. It's, it's so fun. Uh, you know, I, I recently converted to being a Tesla owner. Nice. And uh, I like driving fast. It's fun. Yeah. I ride motorcycles. I used to cycle pedal bikes up the canyons and, and whatnot, but I, I, converted to motorbikes and now I'm fatter <laughs> but as long as I'm on uh, two wheels I'm happy and the wind's yeah. in my face um, I uh, I'm not perfect at it but I, I speak multiple languages yeah. uh, some weird ones like Arabic and Farsi and uh, for me it wasn't for me it was more I like learning languages to learn how people think because you know different languages have different you know grammar and different ways of approaching a sentence and that's how people think and it's, it's exciting to see how some of the older ancient languages um how that because that how that process started so that that brings me happiness to challenge my memory and to learn yeah. about people and languages it's one of my favorite hobbies actually oh, that's way cool so so how good are you at arabic i'm i'm okay at all of it i yeah. i i actually i have a friend who's muslim and uh he Taught me pronunciation by helping me recite the Quran. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I've memorized a few surahs and uh, yeah, so it's fun. 
That's way cool. How'd you meet him? Uh, so I was, uh, it was, it was just through kind of friends and he invited me to do a Ramadan with him. It was just kind of like an invite. I'm like, I guess, you know, that's what you do when you're, you're in a, a religion, you invite people to, to yeah. do the activity. So I did the Ramadan with him. And during the Ramadan, that's when he taught me grammar and Arabic. That, that's the month long yeah. celebration kind of thing, right? Where you don't eat during the day, you only eat at night. Yeah. 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 You eat at that, that when the, when the sun goes down at that prayer, you, you do the, you do it and you eat. And it was fun. I even learned that even, <laughs> even do that process. It's really interesting. There's different levels of commitment to Ramadan. I mean, there's the guys that uh, would just eat a huge feast and the guys that would eat a normal meal or there are guys that eat a light meal. Oh, uh, you know, I was the huge feast guy. <laughs> yeah. So you only eat once a day on Ramadan. Yeah. Okay. And then you have a, well, you eat your big dinner and then when you wake up, um, so as long as it's, you could eat up until the first prayer in the morning. So before the sun comes up. So I would, I would have uh, some water and some dates. It's kind of like the, the morning tradition or yeah. some tea. So, nice. I thought that was a fun experience. Uh, I was. Have you only done it once? Done it once. Yeah. Yeah. Would you do it again? Yeah. Yeah. I would. Yeah, that's cool. I, I love cultures like that, especially when you're really sharing them. Um. I get really annoyed with the word cultural appropriation these days because I'm just like, I feel like this is like a barrier to human sharing experiences with each other. You know, it's like if you went to the Middle East and they didn't want to share their culture with you because they didn't want you to steal it or something like that. You know, Interesting. It's like your life would suck yeah. you know, if you weren't sharing cultures. Absolutely. Be very, very, very vanilla. I wonder what it would look like. It's almost a Ugh. scary thought. Yeah, no, seriously. Yeah, because yeah, I, I think, you know, whatever whatever culture we have, it's it's so it's so mixed. I mean, we do Christmas stuff, but where did that even come from? You know, so yeah, exactly. Like, like how do we get all these traditions? <laughs> <laughs> so. Exactly. Well, my friend, thank you for coming on the podcast. So we've hit about our hour and a half. Wow. Isn't that wild? That's wild. I thought we just started a, a couple minutes it ago. Feel, yeah, it feels close. Well, yeah, I guess I just close. like talking to you, so. Yeah, yeah. So I asked all my guests, like I kind of told you at the beginning, I need your best two minutes of advice. Yeah. So, so for me, you know, I talk to the, the people I talk to. It's like, well, how do you how do you get going and doing something outside the normal paradigm of work? Like, you know, going to your nine to five or or just accepting kind of the status quo of life. And, and it's, it's interesting. I, and I said this kind of at the beginning, um, if you really just, if you really put together some goals or some thoughts and, and the right metrics and, and, and have an idea, if you just start little by little every day and taking chunks away and developing it and learning, you could, you could really just do anything you want. I mean, there's no limitations to, to what you could achieve. Uh, so for me, I just, I just go after things. Um, it's interesting when I think about what I, what I do for work, I do stuff people don't want to do. When you wake up, you don't want to do the stuff I do. Like people, you know, you know, they want the the security, sometimes the, the job that puts them in a box. Well, I'm, I'm outside the box always, and I'm doing really hard stuff. I mean, I think I, I learned this thing when I was younger in college, I think, what was I don't remember the guy's name, but he says everybody sweeps the floor. And he was working for Bain, and he was an executive or some junior executive. And they told him, okay, when you're done with this paperwork, go sweep the floor. And he's like, why? And, and, and the lesson was everybody sweeps the floor here. And I've, I've, I've taken that, and I ran with that. It's, if you want to be successful, you're going to have to learn how to sweep the floor. Um, you're going to have to learn how to just execute Every, everybody, most everybody has a good idea, but people aren't executors. So I say sweep the floor, do what other people don't want to do, and just execute continuously. Um, stop talking about it and just go and do it. And you'll be surprised what will happen just from the motion. You'll meet people that help spin you in the right direction, give you advice, maybe give you a contact that's your first client or a contact that, that's your partner and the partner that knows the stuff to get you your first client. And you just continually move in that motion. And then you realize what you're doing is not what you really want to do. But because you were in that motion, you found what you want to do. And then you develop that for a while. And uh, it all starts with execution. So I'd say that's that's my advice. 
and be resilient as <laughs> be resilient. You know, there's there's going to be some pain, but uh, push past it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Everyone's got pain. Yeah. Why cry about it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think pain is what makes it separates that the tolerance for pain separates people that don't make it and people that do. Um, so get tolerant, <laughs> go sweep the floor, go, go dig holes. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Sweep the floor. That's good. So well, anyways, thank you very much, man. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for listening to the president McCormack podcast brought to you by McCormack foundation, Saxton fund, ADP Lemco and professional floor systems. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and keep up with Mark on Instagram at President McCormack.